Before you watch the video, we kindly ask that you hit the like button. It costs you nothing, helps us a lot. On to the show. All right, folks. Super duty tough work. We are here. It's your boy Blueprint. I have a special guest with me this week. A special guest is my ex partner in rhyme, aka Mr. Inkwell, Bus, as I know him, Ron Cunningham, friend, um, fellow MC, uh, founding member of Greenhouse Effect, uh, my college uh, uh, partner. Right. Mr. Freestyle in the motherfucking dorms and all over campus and rhyme and being everybody's faces. And uh, I got him here today and it's, it's an honor to have him here today because, you know, he mentioned to me that he was trying to write a book, you know, a year or two ago. And he asked for my advice on a couple of things related to releasing a book. You know, I gladly ob obliged. Well, today the book is done. The book is here. And I thought that it will be a perfect time to bring him on to speak about uh, not only the publishing of his book, but just about the process that he went through. And hopefully it will inspire many of you who are thinking about writing a book. Um, when you look around and you ask people what item is on their bucket list. Invariably, at least 75 percent of the people are going to have write a book on there. This is one of the rare things that's on everybody's bucket list to write a book. And uh, very few people actually do it. You know, my my guy, he is here. He has a dope book. I've read the book. I ordered the book off of Amazon and it's a dope, inspiring read. And uh, you want to talk about um, his process as a writer, what got him here and uh, hopefully drop some jewels to kind of get you all geared up to write your first book. Um, if you listen to this, I hope you and you've been thinking about writing a book. I hope that this inspires you to take the next step just as Bus did and end up with just like something beautiful like this in your hands at the end of the process. And so, uh, yeah. How you doing today, sir? Good, brother. I'm good. How are you? I'm good, man. How you like that intro? How you like that? Man, you dope, man. You already know that I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm biased anyway. Yeah, you know what I'm the, saying? So at yeah. the end of the day, I'm going to be like, yeah, but that, that was that hotness. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> but no, nah, I appreciate it, man. Um, all of that was uh, everything that you said was facts, so it was good. Hell yeah! So, um, yeah, we're gonna talk about his book, Unwrapped Gifts. We're gonna also talk about uh, publishing your first book, and so we'll take a break and we'll be right back. We got you stuck off the realness, the most infamous. You heard of us, official podcast murderers. The show comes equipped with few points to share. Grown man ideas for all those who care and want to grow. So go ahead and download every single week with a brand new episode. You're not alone in this world, cousin. So we share information and honest discussion and keep repping a culture like we supposed to. They spread gossip, but they never come close to. I can hear it inside their tone. They talk about the industry but never left their home you get laced up with bullet points and such plus empowering topics that they never would touch you can put your whole network against the team but super duty tough works the mvp most valuable podcast on mp3 priceless info but all of it's free huh. so take these words home and think them through super duty tough work is coming at you now listening to Super Duty Tough Work with your host, Blueprint, raw and uncut, adult conversations, no shucking, no jiving, and no bullshit. All right, folks, Super Duty Tough Work, we're back. It's your boy, Blueprint, with an interview this week, talking to my guy, newly uh, published, self-published author, Ron Buster Cunningham. Uh, you may know him in the circles as Mr. Inkwell, Greenhouse Effect. Um, let's take it from the beginning, Buzz. Let's talk about like um, your history as a writer. Like, what got you into writing, and 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 um, how far back does that go? Man, uh, wow. So, I actually first started writing. I would say fairly regularly when I was in the seventh grade, and I um, had entered a. Uh, contest from my English or in my English class from seventh grade. And uh, my teacher was really impressed with my writing. And 
she was like, oh, you know, we, we're going to enter you into this uh, into this competition and we're going to see how it goes through the school. So went through the school. I won a couple of uh, writings. Uh, mm-hmm. They got put up on the walls mm-hmm. of Indianola Middle School back in the day. Man, I don't even know where those writings are, man. It's sad, but... At the same time, it was it was inspiring for me. So I I actually continued writing poetry from time to time. I just wish I would have kept some of those books. Mm, that's dope. At that time, did you uh, did you ever think anything further of it, or was it just like just something that you felt in the moment? Nah, man. Um, honestly, is what I felt in the moment because, and I'll be honest, man. I was I was a smart kid, uh, uh, and the, the challenges with that was was. And you'll you'll know this and hear this in the book. A lot of times when you're smart and you're you grow up in the hood, I was raised in low family and with a low family income. Mm-hmm. And they they were always behind me saying, hey, you're you're really, really smart. We think that you should do this. Mm-hmm. And they was telling me what I should do. And it never really included writing. Mm-hmm. So as a kid, I was always distracted by. You know, they're they're I wouldn't say they were living vicariously through me because, you know, when you're living vicariously through somebody, it's they wanting them wanting to be what they want you to be, what they felt that they couldn't be. Mm. Right. So ultimately, what uh, what I was what I was doing right then was just being distracted by the, the fact that everybody was telling me that I should be a doctor or a lawyer or some high money making thing. And that was yeah. because of the fact that most of us was broke, you know, to be honest with you. So, yeah. Um. So as a kid, I was never really inspired to write. I just did it as a hobby. And mm. uh, that even kind of I, I, I still wrote through through high school. But it really didn't get to me until I got to college yeah. uh, when I when, when I really started writing and I started writing more for uh, primarily myself. Yeah. Yeah. When I met you in college, some of my first memories of you are, you know, this was the era before everyone had a PC or a laptop. And, you know, we was in the, in the tower and they had these computer labs on every floor. Yeah. Right by the elevator. So as you yeah. got off the elevator, you had to go past that computer lab. And I go past that joint and you be in there on the computer writing up your rhymes. You was you was the first guy I know to really write his rhymes. Type them, yeah. really to type them, period. Like <laughs> I knew guys who wrote rhymes in a notepad. You was like, nah, I'm taking this off the notepad. I'm cataloging this joint. Yeah. I'm printing it off. <laughs> <laughs> Serious. Yeah, you know what's crazy, man, is yeah. uh when we was i remember i remember us being in the hallways that was some fun times actually yeah uh, you beatboxing i'm beatboxing <laughs> we rhyming we would be in the hallways all night long man and Straight people up. would be coming down the steps mad at us like <laughs> get out of the way you know like just just and they knew they really couldn't say nothing to me because you no. know i'm six four at the exactly. time i'm probably about 315 yeah 300 something Muscle, pounds man <laughs> <laughs> so they wasn't they wasn't talking crazy man but you can see that you know they got the, the eyes like this like they, yeah. but um but yeah man i remember being in that in that uh in that computer lab writing mm-hmm. away man and 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 us doing rhymes and and whatnot yeah. and my problem was is i could think of rhymes quickly and i could do things but i was too much i always was the perfectionist when it came to that type of stuff so yeah. I, I was like no, I didn't like what I said there. So if it was an error, I didn't really know how to turn the error into to a to a plus, which yeah. I would learn how to do later. Uh, rhyming with you and Illogic and, yeah. and those cats, man, y'all was freestyling. I would be in the corner like, oh man, come on, man. you you got to think of something, ain't <laughs> think of something. <laughs> you know, it's funny. I never I never picked up on the on the perfectionist vibe from you, and all the time us time doing music, you were always at least at that time. Once we started getting to the recording you were always very secure by the time you got maybe Cause just like your tools as an MC were so powerful, like your voice dope, your delivery was dope. You know what I mean? I guess it's all together, but I never got the feeling that you were like tripping on your material. Like you always slips up like, yo, this shit is fire. I know this. I, I got this. <laughs> <laughs> you know what, man? I, I think I would say that that just comes. I, I've, I have this weird confidence yeah. in myself, right? Like I, I, I was one of those cats, man, where I felt like uh, I wasn't going to lose at too much stuff. So <laughs> in the in the process yeah. of thinking that or feeling that, I would uh, a lot of times you wouldn't necessarily see it. But I know we would be recording, man. Mm-hmm. And uh, you'll be sitting there and you'll be like, yeah, I like that tape. Mm-hmm. And I could see and I would sense like 
yeah, he like it because he getting tired of recording. <laughs> <laughs> or does he like it because it's really fire? And then I would hear a little blip, and you'll be like, "No, man, we don't need to re-record that." <laughs> I'd be like, "Yes, yes, we do." <laughs> but at the but when I when it finally hit, I finally was like, "Okay, yeah, I'm, I'm feeling that. That's cool. I like it." Yeah, yeah. So talk about and you mentioned it like you grew up writing, I guess, more casually, and then hip hop kind of developed it um, even more. Now. You also said that you didn't really have much of a desire to pursue writing professionally. And you had people in your family who wanted you to pursue like medicine and things like that. But you, what was it that, that made you put off writing during those college years in terms of like maybe a major or a minor? Yeah, man. And, and hindsight, you know, being what it is when it's clear 2020, I, I wish I would have uh, pursued that and perfected uh, mm. my writing in so many different ways, shape, forms, and fashions. Being, you know, being able to uh, do things like proofreading or uh, expanding my vocabulary, things like that, that would have been something that I would have ventured into by being in those writing classes. Mm. But what was interesting was, was uh, when I was in college, man, um, the funny thing was, is when my parents, uh, you know, like I said earlier, they, you know, they, they didn't necessarily look at writing as one of those things uh, to be a way out of the hood. You know, yeah. it was, it was just, that's hobby. That's something that you do. Poetry is hobby, you know, mm. writing short stories is hobby. I wrote many things, man. Not even just that I, in high school, uh, me and a cat named Marlon Kerner, we, we actually wrote a play and mm. uh, we did really well. We had to write the play. We had to act out the play. And uh, the writing part of it, I thought was really good, man. I mean, you know, we were bouncing ideas off of each other and uh, that actually ended up doing well. But at the end of the day, man, um, what it ended up boiling down to is is the thought process of when you got so many people in your ear and they can become a distraction, which I talk about in the book. You mm -hmm. know, they they become distractions and they basically are saying, hey, you know, we want you to do this. We want you to do this. And and unfortunately, man, I'm extremely loyal to a certain extent to family. Yeah. Um, and when I say unfortunately, it's because a lot of times uh, family have their best interest in mind for the individual self, even though they love you. Yeah. And at, at there are certain points that you got to be uh, the, the keeper of whatever's good for you. So I, I had to determine at some point that, you know, that was not good. But during college, man, I really wish that I would have uh, uh, turned on that um, fire hydrant and allow it to play in the street. Mm. Because there was a gentleman by the name of uh, Dr. Otten, who was a creative writer, man. And mm -hmm. he, everything that this dude did with writing, he, the way he would read it, what he wrote, uh, you know, basically the way he taught, he taught with so much passion and writing, man, that it it really intrigued me. Yeah. And I really thought about being uh, an English major mm -hmm. because of Dr. Otten. But in the back of my head, the influence kept saying, oh, man, you know, you're, you're this, you could do that. And, and at that time, you know, I felt like I was wasting a year, two years in school trying to figure myself out. But really, that's what college is all about. You know, you're supposed to be figuring out who you are at that time uh, without the distractions. So, uh, you know, that that is what was holding me back at that particular point in time from writing. But that that fire was burning inside of me when I really didn't know it. Yeah. Yeah. You were you were and uh, easily the most passionate person I knew about writing that I had met up until that point. And it's like I would meet guys who would rap, but they weren't necessarily writers. You know what I'm saying? If a yeah. beat came on, they want a freestyle, but they didn't just have rhymes just on deck. Like you were always really prolific. And I also want to put something out there just for the listeners like bus. And he's not going to talk about it much, but he is like he just got inducted into our college football hall of fame. You know, he he was a great football player. And so it wasn't like he was just sitting around the dorms doing nothing, neglecting writing. Like this man was was you know, one of the best players at his position in the country, you know, and coming from a smaller school like ours, that's saying a lot, you know what I mean? Um, so he wasn't just chilling y'all. He, he had a gift. He just didn't necessarily have the focus on it, but he was doing other things that were great as well, you know? Um, and I think it's important people know that because like you do have a competitive spirit in you, 
that some people don't understand. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and Is I, it? Yeah, you, know. you, you, hey man, I listen, know you, you know, you yeah. know, um, how competitive I am, how competitive we'll be. There's so many stories out there, you know, we wouldn't have enough. Exactly. But he knows exactly and how extremely competitive I am. So, and thank you. I mean, I, I'm not, I'm very humble cat, man, uh, when it comes to uh, certain gifts. And I think there's a, there's a point where you got to realize where your greatness lies. I mean, we, we are, and you'll find out in the book too, if you pick it up, that we are all given a gift, man. And the, yeah. the reality of it is that we become responsible for that gift. Mm. And the thing about it for me is, is that passion is one of those things where it would have allowed me to push my gift into another level if I would have actually burned it earlier, you know, mm. but, uh, uh, but yeah, man, I, I was, I was out there in football fields. I mean, whether it was football, whether it was basketball, whatever it was, man, I, I got mm -hmm. too competitive sometimes, but <laughs> It would turn off my it would turn off my flight mode, man. So if you know what that means, yeah, <laughs> I was I was a, I was an aggressive fighter, man. Like, yeah, you know, yeah. I, I got a quick story. I got to tell this one, man. <laughs> my dude, one of my dudes, man. His name is uh, John Bryant, and and back in the day, they used to do these things called tough man contests. Mm -hmm. And there was this cat named Butterbean. Butterbean was this huge. Yeah. Uh, Caucasian cat, man. He was boy headed. He was big, and he was knocking cats out. And I was so competitive. I remember my boy said, "Hey, man, you think you could beat Butterbean?" <laughs> I was like, "What? Man, that's easy work." <laughs> I was like, "Man, I knock Butterbean out." So he kept he kept instigating the situation, man, where I almost literally signed up for a tough man contest just to show <laughs> them I could beat Butterbean. <laughs> Butterbean got hands, man. He did, man. But you know, and Butterbean was about to fight Tyson at one point because they were, you know, people was like, "Who is this dude?" He said, "Man, that dude would have gotten. I would have knocked him out, man." I I say that to this day. I would have knocked him out. <laughs> I'd have collected my ends from everybody who bet against me too. I was, I was ready to put up money and everything. I wanted to sign up for it first, but yeah, man. I, I didn't know that. I didn't know you was ready to squat with Butterbean. <laughs> I wanted to. I'm not gonna lie to you. That's funny. <laughs> yeah, but you know, I mean, that was just that. that I mean, speaking on the competitiveness and you know the all America stuff, man. All of that came from that, man. You know, if yeah. I was at the back of the line, I had to figure out a way to get to the front, and that, yeah. you know, that's really what it boils down to. Uh, what what work are you willing to put in to be able to get your man? I mean, when when it comes to the book, that's what I did. I had to. I had to. I had to work behind the scenes, behind closed doors. I had to ask questions. I mean, you were one of the first people that I would call uh, when it came to that. So, Hell yeah, that's dope. Okay, so we're going to uh, take a break and we're going to talk about, when we come back, we're going to talk about his inspiration for writing this book because it's a very, that's one of the more interesting parts of this book. And I think it's something everybody can relate to. Um, so we'll take a break and we'll be right back. <laughs> This is your weekly reminder that we have two books that you as a listener or watcher of this podcast need to absolutely own. The first is the 10 traits of successful hip hop artists. And the second is the social media cheat code. Both of these books were released within the last year. The 10 traits of successful hip hop artists is a book where I go through the stories and explain the traits that uh, are behind the success of some of the biggest names in hip hop today. Um, the book has got nothing but amazing feedback. And if you are an artist, business person, whatever you do, if you would like to be inspired and would like to learn more about hip hop along the way, and also see some, some reinforcement of the concepts that we talk about on this podcast, the 10 traits of successful hip hop is for you. Second book is the social media cheat code. That is for everyone who listens to this podcast, who does not uh, consider themselves an expert or really good at social media. It's not for super experienced people. It's actually for people who are on social media, but are not getting the results you need. So what we did is I broke down like 12 or 13 strategies that I use all the time that actually work really well for me. I put it into book. I gave you examples and I tell you how to implement it. That's a book you absolutely need as a listener to this podcast, watch this podcast. If you're on YouTube, supporting these books actually goes a long way towards supporting the podcast. So uh, to support the show, if you like what we do, obviously we don't necessarily get paid to do this shit. So support the products and services that we create 
And these two books are a big part of that. We appreciate your support. And uh, back to the show. All right, folks, we are back. Super Duty Tough Work talking about the new book, self-published book, Unwrapped Gifts, Unwrapped Gifts by Ron Buster Cunningham, a.k.a. Mr. Inkwell of Greenhouse Effect. And uh, this book, one of the chapters that really kind of stood out to me was how you you were able to weave in your inspiration for writing the book into the theme of the book as a whole, because the book is really about like having a gift, but not really tapping into it, not unwrapping it, like how people have gifts, whether they're for themselves or for others, that sometimes when they don't use, you know, they don't tap into life's fullest potential. But you started talking about how there were like four or five things that really kind of pushed you over the edge. Um, and oh, I'm going to say forced you, but they were like, okay, now nah, this is it. I have to pursue my gift. I have to write this book. I can't let this wait any further. And, um, it's, it, it's a very big why, you know what I mean? Like everyone needs a why to do what they do. Uh, you have something and one of them is very tragic. Um, but I like you to talk about like, that section of the book and why it was important to put that in there. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and, you know, you, you couldn't have said it better yourself, man. I mean, everybody has a gift. And one of the gifts that was given to me was the book itself. Um, and what was interesting was, is that the original, uh, title of the book was don't die inside me. Right. Mm -hmm. And, uh, which was weird because I was always like, Oh, okay. You know, we got gifts people transition with these gifts and unfortunately we don't get to see the best of them mm. and what was interesting was was i was procrastinating which is in the book of course uh mm -hmm. i was procrastinating a lot and um i had this title and you know i just kept hearing you know uh the voice speak to me like hey man you need to get this book written you need to get this book written so i kept saying okay i'm, I'm gonna write it i'm gonna write it so what was interesting is there was a series of events that really kind of pushed me over the edge, like Blueprint said. And uh, the first thing was, was uh, I was, I was in a, taking my daughter to a performance. She was actually performing for what we call the Columbus Symphony Youth Orchestra. And she plays strings in this group. And I was taking her there. And um, all of a sudden I'm standing out waiting to go inside. And I hear somebody say, Kobe Bryant just died. And I was like, wait, what? Kobe, Kobe Bryant? Like, how, you know, Kobe Bryant, healthy, strong. It's like, you know, the first thing that you think of is like, man, somebody murdered him, you know, or something, something weird happened. But no, you know, brother died in a helicopter crash. Uh, you know, and then shortly after that, you know, uh, you know, I was, uh, you know, sitting at home and, and, and started hearing rumblings about, uh, a young man getting killed while out jogging. That young man actually happened to be Ahmad Arbery. Mm. And for some reason that touched me, man, because, you know, I was out jogging at the, not when he got killed, but I was out kind of running around a little bit because, you know, as, uh, as I might have alluded to earlier, man, I used to be 340 pounds at one point, you know, I mm. got really big and I was trying to make sure that I was maintaining my weight, keeping a healthier thing. And, you know, I was like, man, that could be me. You know, you got just somebody just walking up on a young man and just killing him. But the bad thing about it was, was how he was killed. I'll let you hear the rest of the story if you go look it up. But then not too long after that, COVID happens, right? Mm -hmm. So now you got people and family members or friends, you know, that are dying from these things, et cetera. And uh, come May 7th of 2020, I'm just kind of fast forward and I uh, happened to be coming home and I found out that not necessarily found out at that moment, I was actually going to help her. I went over to my mother-in-law's house and, um, you know, she's suffering with stage four cancer. I was coming back and I was talking to my dad on the phone uh, while I was driving. And then uh, I see these young little boys about to cross this street. This intersection is huge. And the problem with this intersection is, is that it dead ends uh, into the, the city. So basically the freeway comes into the city. So, when you're going through this light, it's about 60 miles per hour, 55. I mean, if you're, if you're obeying the speed limit, the speed limit is 55. And we were all at the light waiting for these three kids to walk past, man. And um, one of the kids who was out front, he was leading the way. His name was Dijon. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, man, Dijon got hit. 
And, uh, you know, the, the, I, I explain and express a lot of that in the book, man. And it was just, it was, it was terrible. It was terrible to see first and foremost. And it was, it was, you know, it was, it, it, and I'm not going to lie to you, it messed with me. Mm-hmm. And then um, shortly after that, George Floyd happened. So here I am, man. I, and, and I will tell you, man, not many people, especially men will, will appreciate what I'm about to say, but I went through a stage of depression that was like tearing me apart because here I am, I'm seeing this young kid die. Uh, I'm seeing all of these things happening, but there was a point where before all of this happened, you know, like right after D John had passed, I had asked uh, God, I was like, you know, why did you want me to see this? Why, what was, why did I need to see this? (laughs) And the, the, a calming voice just came over me and said, because you weren't listening, because you weren't listening. And I was just like, wow. And that's what kind of threw me into the depression because I was procrastinating. I knew he had given me the key to something and I was procrastinating. It was a gift. And, uh, you know, I had written uh, an album about it, man. I had gone into some Christian rap for a little bit and it was called uh, the parable of talents Mm. and, uh, in the parable of talents, there was a lot of things that was happening in that where God was took away the gift of someone that, uh, well, not the guy, but the keeper, he took away the gift that someone had, um, because they weren't executing that gift. And mm-hmm. and I was feeling that same way, like, man, I, I'm what's going on here. And that was it, man. That was the straw that broke the camel's back. Once I really got out of that, pulled out of that depression state, I got onto the book, man, and, and literally wrote the book like in three months. That's dope. That's super dope. Yeah. When you describe the way you tell the story and I'd heard the story from you about the young man dying in a car accident right in front of you getting hit, struck by that car. When you told me on the phone, it hit me one way. When I read it in the book, it really hit me even harder because it was like, I can imagine that anybody witnessing that is going to be traumatized. Like there's some things that you just never forget you know, some are good, some are bad. And that's one where like, you'll have that with you for the rest of your life. And the question becomes, okay, what do you do with that energy? Do you become paralyzed and traumatized by it? As many would, and no one would fault them for, you know, people go to war every day. And when they come back damaged and hurt, we get it. But we don't think as much about the people who see tragedy right in front of their eyes, who are not in quote unquote war zones. And that's what you saw. You've seen it your whole yeah. life. You know what I mean? Like yeah. the way we grew up, the things that we know about each other yeah. and how we grew up, yeah. we grew up in, in what many would consider war zones. Yeah. You know? Oh, yeah. And um, I think that what you've done with it in this book is kind of lay out a map, not just say, hey, this is how you do it, but it's saying, hey, look, look, look what has happened to me. Each and every time I had an opportunity to develop this gift, I kind of didn't do it. You know, you have, and, and what's even dope about this book um, too, is like some people may not know why they don't tap into their, their gifts. They may just think, well, maybe I'm not talented enough or maybe like you literally go through all the reasons, you know, whether it's consistency, whether it's fear, whether right, like you break it all down as you tell your story. Yeah. Um, I think that's super, super dope. But like your inspiration for this book is something that I think a lot of people can relate to. Um, There's a bunch of stuff that happens in our lives and how we interpret that can, can make us or break us. And I, I, I think it's super dope that you, you made something of it that will hopefully inspire others, you know? Yeah. But, yeah. I agree, man. And and I think the, you know, at the end of the day, I think that we all inspire each other in different ways. We all become teachers yeah. at some point in time, you know, and that's one of the reasons why, you know, a lot of people do want to write a book. That's why it's on their bucket list It's where they want to be able to allow it to be able to reach as many people as they possibly can without it being, without them having to be in front of them. It's kind of like music too. You know, music is that way. You know, mm-hmm. music is a short story, a bunch of short stories, basically, uh, you know, artistically created to be able to tap into people in a way that, you know, they can relate to it. And uh, the, I think the, the, the 
the challenging thing is, is how we allow these things like fear, distractions, mm -hmm. uh, procrastination, uh, whatever it might be to, you know, self-doubt, you know, mm -hmm. well, that's one of the biggest fears, self-doubt. A lot of times, man, people feel like my gift is not good enough. Mm -hmm. It's not. Yes, it is. Don't, don't, don't short play yourself. It may not hit every, every person that you wanted to hit. That's okay. You know, the gift is meant for who it's meant for. And that's, that's what, one of the things that I wanted to be able to make sure that was articulated in the book, because, you know, we all say to ourselves, man, like, I, I need this to be big, you know, mm -hmm. it, it needs to be big. But what we don't know is how big it is to the person that it gets to, right? Mm -hmm. And that's the thing that's really important um, that I found out uh, in regards to writing it. You know, I have my own self-doubts, man. You know, I had uh, a lot of things, but one of the things that I did in that book to be able to help me overcome my shortcomings of not being pro a professional writer, so to mm -hmm. speak, was writing that book for myself. You know, I had to identify who this book was for. And because I knew that it was be, would be able to touch one. And if it touched one, that including me, I would be able to actually use that to be able to touch other people. Yeah. So I'm the one that touches others, man. You know what I mean? And I did it based on the fact that I knew that there was some urgency around doing it before you transition with that gift inside of you, because every gift that we get is meant to be shared. That is what being human is. Yeah. We, we have to be able to share what's inside of us in order for our ourselves to even feel, even feel fulfilled, you know, in this, in this journey that we call life. Yeah. Well said, well said. Um, we're going to, so we're going to take a quick break and when we come back, we're going to talk about your writing process. Um, because I think that is an area where a lot of people can learn from. It wasn't necessarily easy um, because it was something you'd never done. But I would like to kind of demystify that so that people can hear like, hey, I can do this, too. And so uh, we'll take a break and we'll be right back. Quick announcement. Over the last several years, we've been asked many times by the listeners of the show if we would ever open it up to the public for advertising. We've always been interested in this, but we never had the systems in place to make it work properly. I'm proud to announce that we are officially accepting advertising from the public on Super Duty Tough Work. Meaning, if you're a small business owner or an artist and you'd like to create more awareness about your product, service, or release on a Super Duty Tough Work podcast, we're now in a position to do that. For more information, Email us at superdutytoughwork at weightless.net. Again, that's superdutytoughwork at weightless.net. Email us there. Tell us a little bit about who you are, what you would like to promote, and we'll get back to you as soon as possible to let you know if we think it's a good fit and what the next steps are. Thank you for your time. Back to the show. All right, we are back, folks. Super Duty Tough Work, talking about publishing your first book with Ron Buster Cunningham. And we're talking about his book, Unwrapped Gifts, which is out right now on Amazon. Um, let's get into like your writing process. Um, did you, how hard was it for you to um, establish one and stick to a writing process? Yeah. So uh, what was interesting was uh, once I actually committed, I, I said to myself, um, like, OK, I'm, I'm going to write this book and I know that I'm supposed to write it. It felt like uh, everything started to fall into place. And what I actually did is I said to myself, and this is funny because you and I had talked at one point. It was it was some years ago mm -hmm. and I had talked to you about writing a book and it was a while ago. And you was like yo, man, what I do is if I write even small amounts, you know, if I just get down 300 words mm -hmm. in a day, you know, I feel like I'm making a step forward. And I actually use that as, as a guiding principle. Mm. Like I, I said to myself, like, okay, even if I don't write a lot, I'm going to write something. And what I would end up doing, and this was weird because once I started the process of writing, so I would act, what I did was, is I started breaking down exactly what I really wanted to say. So it, it went through chapters. So I would say, okay, I'm going to write about this and this is going to lead 
to this. This is going to lead to this. So I literally started writing um, in chapters. But what was eventually I would find out was that my mind would start collecting information that I had in my in my data bank that was up here. It just started coming whenever it wanted to. So I I, I couldn't just write in a linear fashion. Mm -hmm. There was times where I would move around in the book and basically start writing and then find out a way to connect that later. But one of the things that I did commit to was just writing on a regular basis. And I said to myself, the first thing that I did when I said writing in small chunks, large chunks, whatever, I said that I'm going to, I set a goal of when I was going to get it completed. Mm -hmm. So when I, I said to myself, and what was interesting was the the date that I said, set that I was going to get it completed by was uh, February the 7th initially. And the reason why I chose February the 7th was because that was Dijon's birthday. Mm. So because I realized that this was bigger than myself, that I, I needed to act with a sense of urgency, I wanted to be able to, to make sure that I had something that was motivating me uh, to, to continue to write. Now, um, what ended up happening was uh, I, I probably went like two couple days over um, mm -hmm. uh, with writing the rough draft. Uh, but what what I found myself doing, man, and this was the craziest part, I would wake up in like at like two in the morning and then I would start writing from two in the morning to like five, six or for about four, four to five in the morning. I'll say that. And then I would fall back to sleep and get up and go to work. Like I knew I had to do that. And uh, then I would come home at night and then I'll be like sitting there thinking like, OK, what do I need to write? And <clears throat> ultimately what, what would happen was is things would just start coming and all of a sudden it was just flowing. And I was like, I can't wait to get to the next chapter. So I would cut off chapters a little sooner than I would really wanted to, um, to move on to the next chapter because I felt like I needed, I had to say something into the next chapter, which is the reason why the chapters are short, that they're shorter because mm -hmm. I did that um, for a reason. I really wanted people to get through the book uh, in a quicker fashion passion because i really wanted to to the 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 inspiration to continue to for them to pick up the book and allow themselves to get through the book quickly and then be in the process of doing whatever their gift is so that that's the reason why i, I tried to make them a little bit shorter so then that way they weren't reading and, and getting into a monotonous uh, you know story or whatever but yeah. ultimately it was just like okay i need to to make sure um, that i write smaller uh, chapters so that it can keep focus on what the per what their per portion of their lives is supposed to be in regards to what gift they're supposed to execute so writing for me at that particular point in time it was really like about flow and then yeah. I would find myself writing you know literally either 300 to 500 words a day mm. or I would end up writing a big chunk so like that those those nights that I would get up in the middle of the night those would be those 2,000 3,000 word nights because I mm. couldn't sleep what 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 was going on in my head yeah how how so how long did it take you to because you mentioned that once you commit it it started flowing i think a lot of people have a phase where they're not quite as committed yet did mm -hmm. you how long did it take you to get from like i want to write a book i need to write this book too i'm committed how long did that process take <laughs> oh man so that 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 was the hard part because i you know um after the the accident with Dijon. You know, I was still kind of in that funk and mm -hmm. I knew I had a book title, but I, ne I wasn't necessarily executing that. And I, I kept procrastinating. And part of the procrastination was self-doubt. Mm -hmm. Right. I would just I, I would feel like, OK, I wrote something, then I didn't like it. I wrote something, didn't like it. But that was the perfectionist in me, too. So <clears throat> long story short, um, it, it, I, I would say that once I got around, I had, I, I'll tell you this little quick bit. I had went to, um, I went on a, a, a retreat with my friends. Mm -hmm. um, it was a male retreat and we just went and we went to Columbia, man. We did some really cool stuff, man. You know, jet yeah. skis, all of that stuff. And it allowed me to flush out a lot of the negative energy that was in me. Mm -hmm. And once I flushed out the negative energy that was in me, I I, I really started to, to refocus on self. You know, it kind of got me out of that depression state. Um, and then once I got out of a depression state, which took about, you know, a month after, I would say not even a month, it was probably about two weeks after that, I, I had refocused myself because I had a lot of time to think there was nobody really around me to distract me, fill my head with other stuff. And once I did that, 
um, kind of what I would call freeing myself up, freeing my mind up. And then I refocused and, and focused on what I needed to do. I got to, uh, that was about, I would say October, late October, early November. And then from November to December, that's when the commitment happened. So late December, I committed to it. And then within three months, man, I was submitting my, uh, my rough draft for, um, proofreading, um, in the beginning stages of proofreading, copy, copy reading, uh, copy proofing is what I looked at first. Yeah. So, um, a technical question real quick. What mm -hmm. software or did you use to actually write your book? Because there are some people who, you know, that can become like this thing where they want to be so distracted by what they're in. Like I wrote all my books, like I wrote a couple in Microsoft Word. I, I've written them in Google Docs. Like wh what worked for you? Yeah, so uh, I actually uh, wrote everything in Word, but switched it over into Google Docs because as it got to my proofreaders, I needed to be able to to move documents in different ways uh, so that they can do editing and, mm -hmm. you know, do some real time editing and things like that. So I could see what was going on. So I I, I wrote everything initially in Word. It was kind of like an old school, you know, pen and pad technique for me. Mm -hmm. You know, it it was kind of like going back to those lab days, <laughs> <laughs> the computer labs yep. where I was just in there typing like. <laughs> exactly. So uh, yeah, so I wrote it. I wrote in Word, um, and would move uh, from Word to 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 Google Docs, and eventually it would go into you know PDFs and stuff like that for exchange and That's different so. things like that when it came to to publishing and stuff. So let's let's talk about you mentioned the proofreading. How long was the proofreading process for for your book? Like how many drafts did you do and how long did that whole process take? Man. Um, so uh, I went through uh, a total of five uh, proofreads. Yeah. Um, so there was uh, the I, I had a, a friend do initial proofing. And we went after we went through that initial proofing, then it went to copy editing. Mm -hmm. um, then uh, from copy editing, it went through another proofing. Mm -hmm. uh, then from that proofing, I sent it to another individual who actually did me a solid. I talk about the law of attraction in the book. Yeah. Um, where you, you know, you just kind of meet people that are going to do things for you uh, because they believe in what it is that you're trying to do. And they're not going to, they're not going to take away from you in the process. Right. Yeah. And, uh, this, this dude, man, he was incredible, man. He, uh, he actually ended up proofing and copy editing, mm -hmm. um, before the laugh proofing again. And he actually did a really, really good. I mean, my first copy, um, editor was really dope at doing the copy editing because she really, um, kind of allowed me to say what I was trying to say. Mm -hmm. But she was cleaning up what I, you know, some of the things and, and she would catch things where I would be, I would be writing, man. I don't even know what I said after I said it. <laughs> I was just kind of like, what did, what did I mean here? Yeah. And then she was, she'll ask me like, well, what did you mean here? And I, and now I would look at it and be like, oh, okay. I know what I was trying to say. And it just didn't articulate because I was trying to write it so fast. Yeah. So, um, they were catching those things, uh, in the book and that was cool And then um, finally, man, I had a, uh, uh, he, he said, let me um, do this one more time. Let me copy and proof it one more time for you before I submit it to you, man. So it took about two months um, for it to, to finally get through the whole uh, proofing stage. Yeah. That's not bad. That's not bad, dude. Yeah. I mean, in two months, you think about it, three months to write, two months of proofing, that's less than six months of commitment. And uh, yeah. I remember telling you, uh, like early on, I said, "Bus," I said, "It's gonna come a point when you actually hold your book in your hand, you might feel some tears about to flow, bro." <laughs> it's real talk. <laughs> it's real talk, man. You know, it's real talk. You know, because I know, like the first time, really every time I hold a book of mine in my hand, it's like you cannot believe it, man. Yeah. Like when you see that final draft, you're like, "Holy shit!" Even before it's printed, like that'll hit you. Like, yo, this is, this is a real book. It's just, this needs to be put in that format, you know? Man, listen, I, I, 
I read your material and, um, you know, I was always proud of you, not just from the the book standpoint, but the musical standpoint, like how much energy man, people don't realize, man, like mm -hmm. the energy, the, all of the, the yeses and no's that you got to go through in order to be able to finalize a project, uh, with such intimacy. Yes. And, uh, you did, man. he was like, Hey man, I'm gonna tell you right now. <laughs> He was like, you might, you, you, you try to, you try to keep it. Cause you know me, man, you like, I'm borderline thug. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you like, you might even cry a little bit. I'm just trying to give you a warning. I'm like, uh, okay, bro. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. yeah. So, uh, so I took it. I mean, I took it as with a grain of salt, man, but I'm not going to lie to you, bro. When I, bro, when I pulled that thing out of the box yeah, and I was holding the package and I was like, <laughs> oh. <laughs> I can I feel it. I was trying to hold back. I'm yeah. Like... <laughs> yeah, it's there's nothing like it. There's nah, nothing like man. it. No, nah, you're absolutely like, right, man. And the feeling is real. Like, yeah, because I think of it like this, man. Your mind is pregnant. Mm -hmm. your creativity all of the different things that are going inside of you that is a gift it's it's, it's your impregnation mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden man when it's out and it it is what you thought it was going to be and what you see it as it's like whoa i just gave birth to my gift mm -hmm. and it's like bringing a child in this world man and that and and I mean, you know, there's some some differences in that, but it's going to take its own life. It'll move. It'll do. You know, it'll touch who it touches, and and all those things, just like a child would. Yeah. So when you when you when you look at it at the end of the day, you know, I was saying to myself, like, man, I'm 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 thuggish, man. I'm not Gary. I'm <laughs> I'm definitely not no thug, y'all. But at the yeah. end of the day, I'm uh, I'm saying to myself. This is this is real, and it was, man. And I just thought about you in the back of my head, and I was like, man, dang, what? Okay, I'm gonna give him that one. <laughs> yeah, hey. I already yeah. know, man. Like, but it's a beautiful thing. Um, so what we're gonna do next is, uh, I want to talk about just like the um, the self publishing part of it, because you know, as we know, there you there's inspiration for writing a book, and then you have to actually sit down and write the book, and get it proofread. And then, you know, the final part of that is the self-publishing part of it. Um, I know you and I spoke on the phone multiple times about the self-publishing part. And I try to make sure I could, I shared everything I knew with you. Um, looking back now, um, were you intimidated by the self-publishing part of it? How do you feel about it now after going through it once? Yeah, absolutely. I was intimidated, man. It was, uh, it was new territory. Um, it was a new challenge for me. But I think I kept believing in what I was writing in regards to the law of attraction. I just mm -hmm. said to myself, like, if this is going to be, it's going to be. So I just got to keep pressing forward. So just like the writing side of it, you know, I was actually doing, uh, you know, research through books and different things like that to kind of help push me along and give me a plan on how I was going to get uh, this uh, published. And to be honest with you, there was a few people who had listened to my idea because I was trying to find proofreaders and, and different things like that. And I ended up running into just, just different publishers mm -hmm. and uh, they were like, hey, man, you know, what, how do you feel about, you know, the publishing side of this? You know, do you want to do that or do you want me to do that? Or And, and honestly, I really wanted the creative control over mm -hmm. everything, at least on this initial book. I just was I, for something um so near and dear to me and 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 there was a lot of transparency in it for me too so mm -hmm. i wanted to be able to have a freedom to to use all of that so um i literally studied um the the publishing side of it and i was doing that as i was writing too so mm -hmm. like as i was writing i was studying i was asking questions you know i was calling you man you'd be <laughs> like yo bus what's up i'd be like hey yo al I got a question <laughs> and you'd be like yeah man okay and you would tell me you know what i needed to hear yeah. um to be able to kind of continue to allow me to move forward you're part of that law of attraction right i mean mm -hmm. we knew each other from years back you had done this before 
Um, that was part of uh, me having the opportunity to be able to have resources in my corner. And the good thing about that is, man, is I was even willing to pay you, you know, yeah. and what did you say? He was like, bus, nah, man, you know, you don't have to pay me for that. You know, I'm give that's, that's, I, I want to help, you know what I mean? And that's, that is the type of stuff that happens with law of attraction, whatever it is, whatever your gift is, there's going to be people in your corner that are going to help you with whatever. I mean, I, I'm literally, I remember saying to myself, like, man, I don't know how I'm going to afford to get these books proofread the way that I was, man. Somebody actually stepped up and did that for me too. Mm. You know what I mean? So I'm just saying, man, like if you think of it's money or you think is uh, whatever it may be, there are going to be some scenarios where those individuals are going to be attracted to whatever that is that you do. That is going to allow you to be able to continue to press forward if you believe in it. If you got to believe in it, man, you got to say to yourself, like, this is what I'm supposed to be doing. Mm. And I I know it. I know it without a shadow of a doubt. And that's one of the things that for me, I was like, man, I know I got to write this book. I know I do. And, you know, unfortunately for me, the the low tragedy is, is you know, the the a little bit of tragedy was involved in it. Yeah. But I realized that, you know, my sense of urgency was necessary to have at that point. Yeah. So let's talk about um, you did a a book release, mm -hmm. uh, like a, a really nice event. You did something different than a lot of the authors would do. Like a lot of authors, you know, they release their book. They might set up um, a table, might read one chapter. You, you, you know, you had a, a real event. Uh, describe what your vision was for your book event and what you did. Yeah, man. So uh, one of the things that I really wanted to do, uh, because the book is not about just me, it's about other people and everybody in this world has a gift, man. We just needed to decide whether we want to use it or not. So one of the things that I, I did was, as I said to myself, like there's different chapters in this book, man, that um, different people may have had experienced with or have had experience with that they can actually tell their side of the story while showing their gift to the community as well. Mm. Right. So uh, what I did was, is I invited some different people out. I invited some spoken word artists. I invited a sculptor painter. I invited a, a DJ. I invited um, photographers and uh, I assigned them um, to a chapter in a book um, that I thought, well, that they thought that they would really feel more, most comfortable with talking on. So uh, what we did at the the book release was, you know, I would read a little bit of the chapter, and then I would ask questions to them about their experiences. So let's say, for example, it was distractions. I would ask mm -hmm. them questions of, you know, what made you distract? What distracted you? How did you overcome that distraction, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. While they were showing off their gift, man, I'm going to tell you, these people were on it. Like they, they not only answered the questions well, it just, the synergy was really awesome. And then what made it even better was, was they had talent. They had gifts that were yeah. really talented, talented. And then they were, inter it was entertaining to those people who were sitting in the audience. Mm -hmm. So there was probably about 80 people there initially, you know, in the, yeah. in the book release, there was a little bit, there were a little bit, I would say people came in and out, but it, you know, at the max yeah. number where I saw it, it probably about 80. Which is extremely but, good. Yeah. Oh, man. That's really good. Yeah. <laughs> like, I, I was, <laughs> I was, I was, it was cool, man. And, and, and what, at the end of the day, what, what I kept the feedback that I kept getting was, was like, wow, man, I'm so inspired by what you did because, you know, from a, a self-publishing standpoint and the, you know, the way that you actually released your publication of this book was an experience. Mm -hmm. It wasn't just you going and signing books for everybody, you, you know, but the, at the end of the day, what I want people to know is that we all have this, we all have it inside of us, man. And, you know, we, we literally sometimes, you know, in some way, shape, form or fashion, you know, we're all normal people, you know, we're all trying to, to, uh, find our way through this thing what makes us not normal is completion mm. everybody else that that you know wants to try to do something they become average when they don't complete what it is that they have their most wonderful desires about and mm. that's the difference between uh you know unwrapped gifts and gifts that stay wrapped up that's still that's very well said man Shit. we should probably end right there because that's just a, such a, <laughs> a beautiful bar 
<laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't know if we can top those bars right there. <laughs> I, I could dig it, man. I could dig it. But yeah, man, I, I appreciate I appreciate you, brother. You just don't know. This is the this is the thing. And this is what I'm gonna probably do uh for everybody listeners of the show. I'm gonna do something uh with my brother right here, Bus, and I'm gonna get like five copies of this book and I'm gonna give them away on, on waitlist.net. Anybody who purchases um my books the next five people purchase this after this episode comes out, there will be an item on the thing for you. And I want to give away some of these books uh, for you. I think that's, that will probably be so that people can just check this out. And then this is on Amazon. For those of you go to Amazon first, for those of you who want to support here, um, I'm going to give away five of these as well. You know, and let me just say this, man, if, uh, if, if blueprint gives you that book, um, do me and him a solid just go on amazon man and you know put in your remarks yes how you feel about it you know whatever uh especially if it's coming to you free and that and that's you know that's just one of those things man where it's all love man you know love begets love you you give love you get love so you know that's uh that's all love what he did what he didn't know is uh there was some things in here i had a book already out here for him i i, I had it already i didn't know he went out and purchased the book <laughs> and if y'all can see this man i'm putting this all the way up in here like uh I oh, see nice. that like I, nice. I, I, we can swap them out then i can sw- yeah you could you you go ahead that this is for you man <laughs> and then um for those who don't know there's a lot of other inspirational things in there and i'm gonna just do this too real quick man this this shirt right here i'm giving to this brother Mm -hmm. this is the new league for freedom shirt man that's that thing is that's these are gifts that i brought for for my brother man um i would never expect him to purchase from me man but you see what he did he he showed me love Uh, that's what we do um you know i i show him love uh, so he knows he knows what time it is, man. Oh yeah. So and tell well, the people tell the people your social media so they can follow you. What's your yeah, handle on man? Media? Um, I'm on, I'm on uh, uh, Facebook as Ron Buster Cunningham. I'm mm-hmm. on uh, 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 Twitter as Inkwell the Poet. Mm-hmm. Um, you'll find me there. And uh, on Instagram, I am also uh. Ron, but I don't know if I changed it or not, man. But I think it's Ron Buster Cunningham. But once you find me, man, yeah. once y'all find me on one space, man, I'll get y'all on the other spots. Yeah. I'm 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 not the most uh savvy, intellectually <laughs> gifted uh yeah. social media head, but yeah. I need to get into it though, for real, because I know that y'all be out there, man, and I I, I really need to follow some of y'all too. So you know, yeah. I really want to be able to do that, man. But yeah, I follow, I follow my man print on yeah. almost and, everything. And we'll tag you. So those of you who are looking for, uh, for bus, every time we make a post about this book, we'll tag him. So you guys can follow oh, that's him. Dope. You know, he's doing a lot of speaking engagement, speaking to colleges, yeah. students, and all of this stuff has started to pop off once his book was published. I know that this man has wanted to do public speaking for years, you know, at a, at a more, you know, frequent level. All he needed was this. Yeah. It unlocked a lot of doors and I'm watching it in real time, y'all. And yeah. um, it's inspiring to see. So follow him. He don't post no bullshit, you know. <laughs> you I can't, know. man. I'm not allowed. No, nah, you're not allowed. Yeah, you're married, man. You can't <laughs> yeah. post no crazy shit on the internet. Yeah. Good. You know, not you got just children. That, man. <laughs> I, I do. But I'm I just I don't know, man. I just don't get into all of the just the the rigmarole. You know what yeah. I mean? Like I just I try to keep it focused, man, and 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 whatever. But I will say this, man. Um a lot of the inspiration mm-hmm. that I get comes from my man blueprint. And we uh we connected early. Um I'm telling you, man, this, this dude is is he's authentic, he's his authentic self, uh, he's his optimum self. So for those who who want to follow something and be inspired, he inspired me too. I'm big brother. He's little brother, but little brother inspired me. And that's cool because that's why I needed to him to, to write rhymes with me. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I, I said, hey, man, you need to write some rhymes. And then we start getting into things together. So it's, uh, it, you know, iron sharpens iron at the mm-hmm. end of the day is what it boils down to. So I appreciate this brother for real. Yeah. Well, thank you for coming on today, brother. And I appreciate the kind words. Yes, sir. You know, so everybody out there, Amazon. Unwrapped gifts, Ronald Buster Cunningham. Go get it. Support this man. We're going to do a deal on waitlist.net uh, after the airing of this. And I hope you guys support there. 
And, uh, you know, I just want some of y'all to pick this up, book up who otherwise may not have and leave a review on Amazon and follow my man. And uh, we'll see y'all next week, y'all. Peace. Stop this recording. Thank you for listening to Super Duty Tough Work. Subscribe to the podcast on iTunes. Follow the podcast on SoundCloud. Peace. Shoot, I got styles already that's more complex than nobody know about. I mean, super duty tough work. Huh?